please welcome the champion of civil liberties and the champion of the Constitution, the advocate of the gold standard and the nightmare of the Federal Reserve, Congressman Ron Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very delighted to be here to visit with this nice crowd and on a very important issue. Uh, faith and freedom and family, of course, is very important, and we are lacking a lot of the enthusiasm for that in this country today. My wife is with me this evening, and uh, we are about to uh, soon celebrate our 54th wedding anniversary. Family, of course, is very important. Um, if a government gets too big, the family is undermined. If we resort to the government taking over family responsibilities, whether it's education, medical care, or whatever, uh, then the family is diminished. The family has been diminished over the many several decades now, especially since the 1960s. And if you look at it carefully, you'll find that the government has grown tremendously since the 1960s. But we have a pretty strong admonition in the Old Testament about the importance of family. When the Israelites uh, live, uh, left uh, Egypt, uh, there were temptations to not follow God's commands. But when they got to their promised land, uh, generally for a good while they lived under judges. They did not have a king. And they had an orientation around a patriarchal uh, family society. But they got bored with this and there was a time when the people came to to Samuel during the time of Samuel and said, you know, other, other uh, countries have kings. We would like to have a king and then we would feel safer and more secure. And Samuel was old and they knew Samuel would die and they wouldn't, uh, the, the children, uh, the two sons of Samuel were not to be considered good judges. So they needed something uh, to reassure them. But Samuel responded by advising them strongly, don't choose a king. A king is going to do you harm. A king will raise your taxes. They will draft your young people. They will use your young women. They will undermine you and uh, your society will break down. And he also said that if you pick a king, what you're doing is pushing God aside and it will undermine the family. And it was utterly amazing of the advice that Samuel gave in Samuel 1st, uh, Samuel 1st uh, 1, uh, chapter 8. Because he talked about taxes and the cost of this would be if you ask for a king. I now think that uh, we have drifted in the direction of accepting a king in Washington, D.C., and I would like to undermine this king that we have been following and building for so many decades in Washington. We need more family values, more governance by the family, not by the United States government. In 1 Timothy, uh, it was said that anyone who doesn't care for his own family has denied the faith and it, that is worse than an unbeliever. So the admonition is very strong in the New Testament that we have obligations to our family. I mean that if you deny, if you do not take care of your family, this is, a, is worse than being an unbeliever. So we have personal responsibilities. But today, just think of the breakup of the family. Just think of how many divorces occur, how many children are born out of wedlock, probably close to half now. And uh, the family is in serious uh, trouble. But then I see this coming about and I witnessed this so much in the 1960s. I was drafted in the Air Force in the 1960s but, and, and this was during the Vietnam era. But a lot of things changed. Uh, in, in, the, in the 1960s uh, due to this war that was not going well, it was an undeclared illegal war but there was so much uh, resorting to drugs and dissension in this country. Uh, there was a breakdown this was the decade when uh, abortion became commonplace. I was a medical resident at that time and the law still said no abortions. 
But the culture changed, the morality changed, the abortions were done. They were being done in the very hospital that I was studying in. And uh, so, the, so the morality was dictating the behavior and what happened in a few years later, by 1973, what happened? The law accommodated to the moral standards of the people. So yes, we complain about the law and we look to the law and we say all we have to do is change the law and we will become a moral people. People. It doesn't work that way. Morality can reflect our laws, but the laws cannot make us a moral people. That has to come from our heart. But it, for, in these last several decades, from the 60s on, there were a lot of different changes. The work ethic was undermined. Uh, the welfare state grew by loop, leaps and bounds. In the 1960s, uh, it was the introduction that government would take care of us uh, for medicine. Uh, we, <clears throat> we moved in the direction that the government would take over our educational standards. It wasn't too long that uh, we had uh, enough activity in Washington to, dealing with education that we had a department of education. But the family is supposed to be responsible for this and to deliver this power and authority to Washington DC has been very detrimental uh, to us. But one other area that occurred uh, during this period of time, as so many things were changing, it was the issue of money. The issue of money uh, was, was uh, a, a major change occurred in 1971 when this country rejected the whole notion of honest money. We delinked our dollar from gold and it ushered a, in an age of a spendthrift government. And since that time, the spending has exploded, the deficits have exploded, the inflation has exploded, the money supply has exploded. Has exploded. At the same time, our personal liberties have been under mind and there is a direct correlation with this but you know biblically there's a strong admonition about honest money in the Bible in Isaiah even in Isaiah they even talked about debasement of the currency debasement is inflation diluting the metals and uh, or clipping the coins today we don't clip coins we just use a printing press but it's debasement strong admonition not to do it it was wrong in Leviticus it tells us that we should always follow honest weights and measures. So there are dozens of, of uh, quotations in the Bible telling us that we should have honest money and honest measurements. We know by, by the Ten Commandments we're not to steal and not to lie. Yet the monetary system that we've had today has been based on stealing and lying. It's equivalent to counterfeiting. If you cannot do it, if you would be arrested for counterfeiting, why do we permit our government to commit to, to uh, commit the same crime of counterfeiting through the Federal Reserve by destroying the value of our money? We should look seriously at this matter. You know, edu education uh, is now the role of government. We, we have a department of education, but how did we get there? Did we amend the Constitution? The Constitution says there it gives no authority for the federal government to be involved in education. So we've just ignored it. We've ignored the Constitution in so many ways. We ignore it going to war. Did the Obama come to us and ask the Congress for permission to declare war to go into Libya or into Uganda? The wars that we've been fighting since World War II have been undeclared. So there's not much left to our Constitution. So our government got involved in, ed in education, not by amending the Constitution. So we have the Department of Education. And all the money we've spent on education, have we improved education? No. The cost of education has skyrocketed. The quality has crashed, now we're graduating thousands if not millions of people from our colleges. Now they have more debt, over a trillion dollars worth of debt, more than all our credit cards. Why? Because we got careless and we said, oh yeah, this sounds good, we might as well do this and ignore the Constitution.
We did this with the housing effort. We decided, oh, the government's supposed to make sure everybody has a house. And now, what has happened? The people who they were supposed to help, they've lost their jobs and they lost their houses. And that is because we are so careless, you know, with, the, uh, uh, with our following the rule of law and following the uh, Constitution. So we are indeed challenged. We're challenged today because we not only ignore our Constitution, but we have reneged on placing the importance of our governance on ourselves, personally being responsible for everything that we do, as well as our family. If we had strong families, we'd, we could have very small governments. If we needed some governments, we could use it locally. But we have drifted a long way from that, and we have accepted a notion that big government is good and they will take care of us. We now believe that safety and security, as the king, as they wanted the king in the Old Testament, that could the king can provide us safety and security. That is not true. Safety and security comes from our own efforts and, and that is especially true in a free society. In a, total, in a totalitarian society, you can be safe and secure, there's no doubt about it, but it'd be being treated like a cattle in a field. You wouldn't be treated like a human being. And too much has happened in these last several decades, both in the form of safety. Spend since 9-11, we have been so complicit in saying, do whatever you want, take away our civil liberties, give us the patriarch, do everything possible to make us safe. But that is not going to make us safe because the king, Washington DC, is incapable of making us safe. What it will make us safe is a strong belief in our own responsibility to ourselves and to our families, to our friends and our neighbors, and assuming responsibility for ourselves. Unfortunately though, going in this wrong direction, we have driven this country into bankruptcy. We now face a horrendous problem because we do not believe in honest money anymore. The most significant and most threatening event today to us as a consequence of this lack of understanding of the value of family and, and civil rights and the Constitution is what has driven us to what we call the debt, the sovereign debt problem. It's worldwide. This debt is so huge, it's bigger than anything has ever happened in the world. And it's threatening our breakdown of our society. We see the riots in the streets in Greece. They're coming here, they're already starting here, and there's going to be a lot of anger because we've had too much dependency on the government taking care of ourselves and not enough responsibility placed on ourselves. And we, a people of faith, should clearly understand how important it is that we not become dependent on the government, whether it's in social means or whatever, but we need to cut back the spending. So I've made a few modest proposals because I think this is so serious that in the very first year, I don't think that we should plan to cut the proposed increases in five years from now. That's not going to work. If you really understand how serious this is, you would agree with me that we ought to cut now, and I suggest that we cut one trillion dollars out of the budget in one year. If this is not done, it will get a lot worse and it will hurt everybody. If you do it in, in, an, in a deliberate fashion and pick priorities, you can cut some spending that will be a lot easier. You don't have to pick on the elderly or the sick. But we could start by getting rid of a few departments. So I've started with, let's get rid of five of them. We'll start with that. HUD, that's a corrupt organization that didn't provide houses and a lot of people raked, it, raked us over in the coals. Department of Energy and Department of Education and Department of uh, Commerce and Department of Interior. Those are for starters. But ultimately, if you want it to stop, if you want big government to stop, you have to deal with the money issue. You have to have biblical uh, money. You have to have honest weights and measures. You cannot do it with a central bank that has been given license to print the money and monetize debt. That is crucial if you want to get the economy working again.
very simply, we got into this mess because we were careless with our Constitution and we have a weak understanding of civil liberties. We have to think of our civil liberties as we think about our religious freedom and also our responsibility and our, and our right to educate our children. If we understand our civil liberties, protecting all the liberties of the individual as well as obeying the Constitution, I really don't think it would be that difficult to get back on our feet again. I think we have a year for a recovery, but if we continue to do what we're doing now, it's going to get much, much worse. We're into this thing. I think our bad recession started as long ago as 10 years ago. It's been downhill. No new jobs, and uh, we've been in the doldrums. Japan's been in the doldrums for 20 years. We were in a depression for 17 years in the 30s. But if we do the right thing and just go back to our roots, look at our values and look at our Constitution, we could be back on our feet in one year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. I get to ask this question again. <laughs> what is your comprehensive plan to shape your future administration's energy policy? And please include how this vision differs from the approach of the current administration. Well, my, my plan is uh, we, we need to produce energy the same way we produce cell phones. We need to get the government out of the way, we need a lot of competition, and we need to deregulate. I've been in Washington off and on for a good many years. I've met a lot of bureaucrats and I've met a lot of politicians. They don't know anything about energy. Why should they make the plan? They have a responsibility for providing the right environment. And that is the market environment. The point I'm making about the cell phones, the markets, in spite of all our problems, the market still delivers cell phones to us. Can you imagine if uh, we gave a contract to the Department of uh, Homeland Security to provide cell phones and they provided one company and they set the prices? It would cost a lot of money and the phones wouldn't work. But, so we don't, need, we don't need a policy other than the policy of the marketplace. We need to understand property rights. We need to understand contract rights. We need to understand competition. But today, and of course, the Obama administration doesn't understand any of this, so I reject everything that they do because they, they interject like putting on moratoriums and, and supporting regulations. But the sooner you can get to the concept of property rights and contracts, all of Texas energy was developed without government. I mean, we came, when we came into the union, we essentially had no government property. But out in the west now, where some of this oil shale and other things are, so much of it is government-owned land. We need to get this land in ownership of private property owners, and then we need to get the government out of the way. If you could reverse one energy... If you could... If you could reverse one energy-related policy decision from the last three years, what would it be and what would you have done differently? Well, there isn't one policy because it's an overall policy of interference. Uh, the policy that this administration has followed is uh, uh, intervention. He follows a whole philosophy of economic intervention. So you have to reverse the policy of Keynesian economic intervention and uh, re-instill in the American people the concept and the understanding of how real free markets work and sound money works. So that is what has to happen uh, but uh, all the policies that result from intervention disturb the markets and you can't do that unless you have a lot of other things. In, in, in order to reverse that, you have to deregulate across the board, you have to change the tax code, uh, you have to have the sound money system, you have to have better trade policies, and all these things would generate the type of, of energy that we need. We do have the energy, there is just no doubt about that, but because we don't understand this issue of property rights and contract rights and true competition and sound money, we're in this mess we're in. Uh, so the goal ought to be freedom, not necessarily
necessarily deciding exactly where you're going to buy your oil. I don't fear the fact that you might have imports. What if somebody wants to sell us something cheaper we can make it? You don't want to deny that benefit to us, but you have to have freedom of choice. You have to have free markets in order to find out where the best deal is. And that should be across the board with all products, not just the energy. Congressman Paul, thank you for being here tonight. My first question is, what would you specifically do to prevent abortion on demand and defend traditional marriage? Well, traditional marriage is obviously, you know, uh, between a man and woman. And uh, I, have, I have supported the Defense of Marriage Act and, and to protect the state's rights, to make sure the federal government never dictates or mandates, uh, you know, the definition uh, of, of marriage. But uh, I have a bill in that uh, so far this evening it has not been mentioned. And I think it's a very important bill because I think we can accomplish a lot with marriage and abortion if we would accept one more principle. I accept the idea of working to change our courts and to change our constitution and I support the idea as an OB doctor I, I know when life begins I know when I assume responsibility for two people because if I do harm to the fetus and uh, I can be sued and uh, so therefore there's no doubt about the legality not only the morality but the but the legality of it but uh, the uh, so I support these efforts but my bill is called We the People's Act, and this can be accomplished not by waiting for the courts to be changed and not for waiting to amend the Constitution. That is very, very difficult. But lives could be saved, and they could have been saved many, many years ago by saying, why don't we get you know, Roe versus Wade repealed by removing the jurisdiction of all these issues from the federal courts. That's what we need to do. When, when Roe versus Wade was a law in Texas, it went to the Supreme Court, they nationalized it. I know it's tempting to wait for the courts uh, to be changed and, and the amendment to be passed, and it's a national solution, and I support that. But it's taking too long. One of the biggest problems we got into, and I remember it so clearly because I had gone through that experience uh, of watching uh, uh, the law change in 1960, and of course with the Roe versus uh, Wade. But you can pass this just with another law. And that would essentially, if, if Iowa passed a law, it could not be repealed. And it could be done just by majority vote with the president that will sign this. So I would definitely work very hard on that to revitalize that interest and try to encourage people to say, yes, it might not solve every single problem, but look at how much it could help. And that is what I think we should do in the meantime until we solve the problem finally by changing the courts or, or changing the Constitution. Thank you. Congressman, what would you do to restore fiscal responsibility and promote creation of jobs in the United States? Okay, the fiscal responsibility, I alluded to that a bit in my opening remarks because it is, it is related to the monetary system, but it's also related to the people's appetite for government. If, you, if we as a people continue to believe that we should have an entitlement system and from cradle to grave. And if you believe that we should be the policemen of the world and have uh, 150 bases and, and uh, 150 countries, 900 bases around the world, and that is, is proper, if we reject the admonition of the founders that said, stay out of entangling alliances and get, don't get involved in the internal affairs of other nations, you can't do it. You can't get back to it because we have allowed 
this desire to do so much. The appetite was bigger than we could afford. And it took so long for us to destroy the productive capacity of this country. For a long time, we were the freest and the most prosperous. And then we still, we started to overspend. And then we tried to raise taxes and that was limited. Then we got borrowing. There was a limit to borrowing. But we had this neat little deal. We sent the treasury bills over to the Fed and they created money out of thin air, which removed the restraints on the politicians. Politicians get reelected by spending money. Do you ever notice that? They come and they spend money and brag about it and they get reelected. But what did it do? It destroyed our jobs, chased our jobs overseas and gave us this mountain of debt. And uh, so the monetary system, if you could not have monetizing of debt, if we did what the founders said, the founders were biblically oriented, but they did, uh, uh, you know, they did bend the rules, they broke the rules themselves with the continental dollar. What they did was they destroyed the continental dollar and they were burnt. And that's why they said, no paper money and only gold and silver can be used. But we threw that out of the window without amending the Constitution where we introduced this notion of corruption in the money and then this explosion of debt. You will not get jobs back now until the debt is taken care of. That is why I've never voted for the only appropriation bill I've voted over all these years has been to help the veterans. And, uh, and we now have to deal with it because when you have lower interest rates and too much spending and pyramiding of debt, what you do is you get tremendous malinvestment and debt that is, is run away. And uh, so the debt has to be liquidated. You have, if you have too much debt, you have to get your debt down before you can get your, your economy, your own personal economy growing again. So you cannot get jobs coming back again. We're not seeing them. We've had 30 million increase in our population since the year 2000 and no new jobs. That is unsustainable. So therefore, we have to look at monetary policy, spending policy, foreign policy, entitlement policy, and the restriction would best be done to get our jobs back by having honest money. We have chased our jobs overseas because of bad economic policy. We have lost faith and confidence in what a free market is all about. We've lost confidence and we have lost our determination to follow the rule of law and do only those things that are authorized in our Constitution. If we did that, it would take a short period of time, but we could get back on our feet again and we would have the jobs. Thank you very much.